Hey, this is David from the Shepherd School. Today we're going to talk about the theory behind electromagnetic pulse. Okay, now, I'm no expert at this, right? I've done some research. I've got a couple years working in the radiological field, but not enough to be an expert or to write doctrine or anything. So I'm going to throw out some stuff. If you disagree, that's what the comments below are for. The vast majority of what I'm talking about today comes out of this FEMA document. Electromagnetic Pulse Protection, Volume 1, The Theoretical Basis for EMP Protection. If you want to try to find this, it is uh, document CPG 2-17, dated February 1991. There are three volumes to this. The first one's theoretical. The other two are practical, talking about how to build and, and use uh, Faraday cages and other protection devices. If you happen to find Volume 2 or 3, let me know because I've been looking for them and cannot find them. But anyway, it's just like a basically military document, lots of uh, lots of math and stuff talking about it. Okay, so in the prepper community, this electromagnetic electromagnetic pulse thing um, is something that that there's some concern about, and there's a lot of mis conceptions out there and because of the technical matter of what we're talking about I've, I've got some notes over here on my computer so if I'm looking um, it's because I don't want to steer you wrong right um, so basically electromagnetic pulse or EMP is a burst of electromagnetic radiation EMR right and basically EMR is energy that travels in a wave right um, and it's classified, what the EMR is, is classified where it sits on the electromagnetic spectrum, the, the frequency spectrum. And to define frequency, frequency is the number of occurrence that occur per unit of time, okay? Uh, and it's measured in hertz. Hertz is, one hertz is one occurrence per second. So, um, average heartbeat, 60 to 90 beats per minute. We'll just say 60 because the mass is easy. If you divide 60 by unit of time, 60 divided by 60 seconds in a minute, you get 1. So if your heart beats at 60 beats per minute, then your heart beats at 1 hertz. Okay? So if you look at the little TV show with the little heart monitor and the you know ER or whatever, and, and you see the do 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 okay, that's that's the graphical representation of the frequency of the heartbeat. Okay? Um, electromagnetic spectrum fits all sorts of things anything that has energy that travels in a wave and it's listed on the chart and I'll put a picture on the article down below but if you look at the chart at one end you've got radio waves you know electricity those sorts of things and the far other end you have ionizing radiation like gamma and, and cosmic rays and on one end you have um, increasing it goes from increasing frequency so, you know, less than one occurrence per second to faster, 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 right? <coughs> and then you've got, and, and at the same time it's going, you know, faster, 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 faster. It's also having decreasing wavelength. Wavelength is defined as the distance between two occurrences. So if you're looking at, say you're out at the ocean and the waves are coming in, right? One wave comes in. And then the amount of the distance from the top to the next top, right? Or from the bottom, you know, whatever. But that would be the wavelength, the distance between the two waves, okay? Um, and so this spectrum consists of, like I said, light, uh, microwaves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet light, and then ionizing radiation like X-ray, gamma, neutron, all that stuff. As a prepper community, we tend to think that EMP comes from two things, coronal mass ejections coming from the sun and nuclear weapons, right? High altitude um, uh, EMP pulse weapons. However, EMP can come from several different sources. Um, high energy explosions, right? Um, suddenly fluctuating <coughs> magnetic fields, uh, cosmic radiation, like I said, 
And, and when the cosmic radiation interacts with our ionosphere, the top of our, uh, of our atmosphere, you get what's known as the Compton effect. And you should look this one up too. But basically what happens in the Compton effect is you have a photon, right? You know, a, a, a beam, right? You get a little photon coming. And it hits an electron and knocks that electron off. So if this photon has enough energy to knock an electron off like a cue ball, that's the Compton effect, okay? And, and obviously it's going to take a very powerful light source to do that. Hence, you know, the sun. All right? Um, so EMP is very complex, and it's more than what we typically think it is. And so the International Electrical Commission has classified EMP into three different types, E1, E2, E3, okay? E1 is our most known, our most common component of electromagnetic pulse. Very, very short duration, you know, you know, milliseconds, um, but very, very intense. And this intense electro, electromagnetic field produces very high voltages in conductors, you know, through, through uh, uh, induction, a lot like transformers. If you have two coils, one coil that's not energized and one coil it is, so you've got electrons flowing through the metal, and, and basically it makes an electromagnet, uh, electromagnet. Well, this coal, putting off its electromagnetism, uh, is going to induce electrons inside the second coal to start moving, which generates electricity. So if you have a transformer, say those little black boxes you plug into your wall to run to your cell phone, right? The one coal has the house current of a high voltage, then it's got another coal next to it that reduces down and basically is making 12 volt out of thin air, right, based upon, you know, the uh, inducted voltages, right? So uh, any long, any, any big long um, antenna, power line, those sorts of things um, is going to induce more of this electricity than smaller stuff. And, and it's kind of similar to lightning a little bit, and so many ham radio guys uh, attribute this to lightning strikes. And so they think that their surge protectors, their uh, circuit breakers, their lightning protection uh, technology will protect them against the EM uh, pulse, the so E1 EMP pulse. Now the, here's the problem with that. With a lightning strike, there's some buildup of time, right? So the surge protector's like, oh, here it comes, and it shuts off, right? Well, with a E1 pulse, it happens so quick. It's kind of like if me and you go out to play uh, uh, softball, right? You got your glove, and, and we have, say soft pitch, right? Underhanded, right? You're like, yeah, yeah. I say, okay, count three, I'm going to throw it. And you say one, and I throw a 100 mile per hour speedball. You know, you're not expecting to get clocked in the head, right? You didn't have time to stick your, your paw up because you were expecting something else. That's how E1 works, right? It, it goes right through any, any lightning arresting um, equipment, okay? Um, this inducted current has reaches what they call breakdown voltages, and it's ten o'clock. It's ten o'clock. Okay, and this breakdown voltage um, is is the voltage in which a diode is caused to run backwards, thereby damaging it. You know, diodes are supposed to run one direction only, allow electricity in one way and come out the other, and stop anything from flowing backwards. Well. If you, if you put enough electricity on the wrong end of a diode, you could bust it and basically make it a conductor shooting both ways. That would fry your, your equipment. Also, it um, can cause insulators to become conductors, and that generally fries them, melts them. Um, it can short out tiny little wires that are close together, like micro circuits. Okay, so that's how it fries everything. Anything with an antenna is going to have more space to induct this uh, uh, E1 uh, EMP, right? But things like your cell phone, your watch, you know, they don't have antennas, they're tiny, so they don't, um, you know, they're not as acceptable to the big long induction. However, the wires in there are so tiny that it doesn't take that much, right? You know, uh, because the wires are tiny, it doesn't take, take enough electricity or take a whole lot of electricity. Whereas your circuit breaker on your house you know, big, thick conductors, it takes a lot of electricity to fry them, but because they're attached to the power line, they get that high electricity. Does that make sense? Okay, now, the way we protect against E1, right, problem E1, solution, Faraday cage, right? 
Um, and a Faraday cage is, is a device that completely encapsulates your equipment in a conductor. And your equipment is insulated from the outside of the cage. <clears throat> Basically, we're going to go back to the ocean again. A Faraday cage is a boulder sitting in the surf, right? And the surf comes and it hits the boulder and it just dissipates around it, okay? So if you're standing on top of the boulder, you don't get knocked down. Take the boulder away, here you are standing, wave comes, and, it, and there it goes. You're, you're done, right? Um, so what a, what a Faraday cage is, is the electricity, the, the pulse comes around it and moves around it and keeps everything inside safe. Now, because of the lightning aspect, a lot of folks think that they should ground their EMP pulse, their, their Faraday cage against EMP pulse. There's two camps on this. Some say yes, some say no. Um, research basically says you don't have to, but you know some people feel the need. I, uh, I don't ground mine because I think that the grounding rod would then act as an antenna to induct that electricity. And that with enough electricity, your uh, Faraday cage and the insulator might act as a capacitor and store up that electricity and, and you know, whatever. So I don't ground mine. Some people do whichever. Float your boat. You just research for yourself on the side. Okay? So the next type we have is E2. And E2 comes from gamma and neutron um, radiation. Okay? Now it's kind of like an aftershock. It, it lasts longer, about a second, than E1, okay? And because it's a pulse that lasts about a second, about one hertz, um, it's very similar to the pulses caused by lightning. So, your technology that protects you against lightning strikes will protect you against E2. Here's the problem. Since it's an aftershock, you have the E1 come by, fry all that, that surge protection equipment, and it's gone. Right? And then, so it's like it's not even there because it's fried. And then the E2 pulse comes a little later. Do, 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 and fries your stuff. Right? So the E1 comes through like a wrecking ball. Busts everything out. And then the more leisurely E2 pulse comes and damages anything that what that survived the first hit. Okay? Um, E3 is the last kind. It's like, uh, it's a little different from E1 and E2 pulses. Um, the last minutes. Right, and and what happens is, if you set off a, a huge electromagnetic pulse, right, it will disrupt or could disrupt the Earth's magnetic field, because the Earth is a big electromagnetic uh, electromagnet itself, with that molten iron core revolving as the Earth moves, and so we've got the North Pole, you know, the the north end of a magnet, right? Well, the EMP pulse kind of knocks it off, right? Well, just like a spinning gyroscope that uh, the North Pole is going to want to go back to where it, it thinks it's supposed to be. And as it moves, just like running electricity through your wire makes electromagnetic, electromagnet, the Earth's magnetic north moving is going to induce electrical currents in those long electrical connectors, those power transmission lines, the, the piping that runs natural gas across the country your railroad lines, any big long conductor and the longer the conductor the more it's going to, uh, to, to pick up this induced electricity, right? And so that's a geomagnetically induced current, right? Now, here recently, a couple months ago, they came out, the government came out with a study saying that EMP pulse would not affect uh, most cars, the computers, because a lot of people are worried about EMP pulse killing the cars. Well, what they didn't tell you is they studied G3, E3 uh, EMP pulses, right? And because a car doesn't have a big long antenna that, that's going to pick up on this, uh, this geomagnetic uh, induction, it didn't do anything, right? So a lot of folks read that study and said, oh, that's BS, uh, E1 would kill a car, right? Well, that's not what they studied. They studied the E3. So um, if you read that study, or you see that study, you hear somebody talk about that study, you know, look into it and see what they're actually testing. Uh, a lot of folks can tell you well, they're testing one thing and not really. Kind of like my cell phones and the EMP pulse videos that are coming after this. Um, I can't make a, 
uh, EMP generator in my basement without getting undue scrutiny, right? Um, so I had to use an x based thing. I'm testing electromagnetic spectrum, right? I figure if something cannot block a cell phone or a family radio, it definitely cannot block, uh, uh, you know, an E1 pulse, right? So it's kind of like a negative test. Um, so anyway, if you want to prep for EMP pulse, if that's something that bothers you, then by all means do it. But here's the deal. You're responsible for you, right? And there's a whole lot of misconceptions and a whole lot of rumors and a whole lot of folks that are trying to say you stuff out there. So do your own research because I would not want you to follow the advice of somebody blindly, make an EMP pulse, protection gear, a Faraday cage, whatever. Not correct, not build it correctly. Think you're safe. Something happens. You pull your stuff out. It, it's fried too. That that would be a bad day. So if you're going to take responsibility, take all the responsibility, and do some research. Now, one last thing. Just want to put out there for you. Just throw it out there. Um, any person, any agency, any nation, terrorist group, or whatever that has the resources to build one hemp weapon, right? Um, probably can build two, right? And if you're going to blow off a nuclear weapon in our atmosphere to disrupt our country's electrical grid, that's pretty much an act of war, right? And if you're willing to do that, then, you know, you want it to be effective because you don't want us to dig our play toys out, right? Because one thing we're good at is, is, is getting people back, right? Um, Pearl Harbor, <laughs> whatever. Uh, so, if someone was to blow off a hemp and take out our grid, anything connected to the grid, any military stuff that's in use at the particular time that's not shielded, not protected, um, it's like, oh crap, everything's gone, must be an EMP, right? Go to my Faraday cage and bring out my stuff, right? What causes, what would prevent them from blowing off a second one a week later, right? Uh, and you can go down the rabbit hole with that, have you, 10 Faraday cages with 10 computers in them just so you uh, um, are always protected. I can't afford that, uh, so stuff in mine, whatever. Uh, I really don't have a lot of stuff in Faraday cage, like a radio and a laptop when I can afford to get one that, that I don't use. Uh, but basically I try to learn how to deal, how to work around this stuff. Use stuff that doesn't take electricity. Um, learn how to reduce, you know, the things that I need, right, uh, rather than that. Or you could just go the expensive route and have, you know, a thousand Faraday cages with a thousand computers in them. Um, it's up to you. But anyway, I appreciate you watching. If you disagree, you got comments, you got questions, like I said, I'm no expert, but you could use the comments below, and I'll be happy to try to tell you what I do know and, and uh, um, you know, listen to your rant a little bit. Alright, so anyway, till next time you can catch us online at www.tngun.com.